and I'll just speak a little bit on how Freud viewed humor. And I think it's an interesting position. And uh, we'll, we'll get to why he felt this way when we go more into the id, ego, and superego. But uh, Freud felt that humor, um, by using humor, we could talk about subjects that normally we wouldn't be able to talk about otherwise in, a, in an emotionally healthy way where we wouldn't feel anxiety. And uh, it was a way to vent repressed feelings in a way that was considered appropriate by people around. And now we're going to get to the idio and superio. So you might remember uh, this material from general psych, since it's one of the first concepts that you learn. Um, the id, to begin with, there's the id. And the id is considered to be the, uh, the basic motivating factor of most human behavior. And what the id is, is the aspect of the personality that contains all instincts, which are the most basic drives and forces a human can experience. And uh, some obvious, some more obvious examples of instincts that we have are hunger, thirst, and sex. And the way that it works is, it works through the unconscious, and it's governed by the pleasure principle, which is when a need arises, the id wants immediate gratification of that need. And uh, Freud theorized that there's a collective energy associated with um, all instincts that comprise the id, and uh, that was what he called the libido. And uh, he felt that libidinal energy was what accounted for most human behavior. And uh, to go along with this, because the id focuses on basic impulses, uh, the, uh, the means by which the id uh, satisfies needs are equally basic. The first of these uh, means of satisfying a need is called a reflex action. And uh, that's something that's automatically triggered when certain discomforts arise. So for example, sneezing and recoiling from a painful stimulus are examples of reflexive actions. And uh, the second means of satisfaction is wish fulfillment, which we already talked about a little bit. Um, that's when the id conjures up an image of an object that, that will satisfy an existing need. So for example, um, in that case, let's say uh, you have a roommate who is really lonely and he really wants to, uh, he or she really wants to have a significant other in their life. Um, let's say that this person is too afraid to go and ask out a girl that they like but they're, they're feeling lonely right now and they want to feel better. So uh, an example of wish fulfillment in this case with the id would be to uh, imagine the person that they like being in a relationship with them, which uh, makes their desires uh, come to life inside their mind rather than in reality to uh, temporarily satisfy the need for uh, the relationship. Okay, so the next segment is the ego, and uh, we find this term used a lot in English outside of a psychological setting, and um, that's something I've always wanted to research personally because, uh, because it's been used in so many different ways throughout, um, throughout the last century or so since Freud's theory became popular and unpopular. But uh, basically what the ego is in this context is uh, it's the negotiator between the id and the superego. Um, it helps us decide, it's, it's the means by which we decide to uh, regulate our id and our superego in a way that uh, allows us to appropriately get through life. So the ego's job is to match the wishes of the id with their counterparts in the physical environment. Um, so basically when we want something, for example, let's say uh, the same roommate that you had that we just talked about earlier, um, because they want a relationship, but they don't know who they want a relationship with, let's say they see someone who they, they think they might be interested in, by applying that desire 
to uh, something in the real world, like a girl or a guy that they find to be attractive. Um, that's basically the ego in, in function. When the ego finds an environmental object that will satisfy need, it invests libidinal energy into the thought of that object, thus creating a cathexis. cathexis. And what a cathexis is, is an investment of psychic energy in the thoughts of objects or processes that will satisfy a need. So when you translate that need into something in the physical world, it becomes a cathexis. So uh, if your roommate has a crush on someone, um, the cathexis would be the person they have a crush on. Um, so finally, the, uh, the third aspect of the personality that Freud uh, developed is called the superego. And uh, what the superego encompasses is uh, morals, uh, morals that tend towards order, uh, that establish right and wrong, and uh, also what's included with the superego is social expectations where something may, may or may not be right or wrong, but it might be inappropriate in certain contexts that you wouldn't normally do in that context. Um, and uh, the superego puts a check on the id because we can't express our most basic desires um, in a way that is culturally or morally acceptable most times. And uh, the ego tries to keep the balance between the superego and the id. And uh, with the superego, uh, when you have a cathexis, um, the superego might tell you to, uh, for example, let's continue with the example we've been using. Uh, the superego might tell you, for various reasons, that the person you have a crush on, you shouldn't continue having a crush on them because of, let's say, your personalities are incompatible or uh, something about them doesn't make them attractive to you that you just found out about. Um, when you take something culturally valued or morally valued and use it to inhibit the association between the need and the object of the need, that's called an anti-cathexis, and that is something that the superego does. So, um, Let's say uh, you're really attracted to a friend of yours and uh, you find out something about them that uh, culturally or morally makes them unattractive. Like let's say, for example, uh, my ex once dated a drug dealer and as soon as she found out about it, um, it tore apart the connection between her need for a relationship and the object of the need, which was her ex-boyfriend who used to be a drug dealer. And because it's it's a moral question and not a desired question, um, it becomes an anti-cathexis.